everyone, I'm Kieran and I'm an architectural assistant at Article 25 um, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming you all to this evening's lecture and the first uh, Make Design Matter talk of 2019. Uh, Make Design Matter is a series of monthly inspirational talks for humanitarians organised by Article 25 in partnership with the BRE Trust. We bring together like-minded design professionals who work to support some of the world's most vulnerable societies and we aim to provide a platform to explore ways in which international development can be approached through community-centred sustainable design. For those of you who aren't familiar with architect Arch Article 25, we're an architectural NGO based in London. We're driven by Article 25 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right to adequate and dignified shelter, education and healthcare. We recognise the importance of infrastructure in building the foundations for strong, healthy and resilient communities and use our expertise to work with local partners to improve health, livelihoods and disaster resilience in areas of the world that need it most. We also use all of our projects as an opportunity to um, pass on essential knowledge and skills to our partner NGOs and local communities to allow them to continue construction projects after we've left and build a, a sustainable future. So some of our projects have included um, a recently completed school in Haiti, a dental clinic in Morocco and a leprosy hospital in Nepal. Um, although we have worked in, uh, we have had 90 projects in 34 different countries, we're a very small charity and rely he heavily on the generosity of our sponsors and dedicated team of volunteers. So if you'd like to support us today, we have some tap to donate machines at the back by the refreshments um, and also on your seats some donation forms if you'd like to become a regular donor and you can donate as little as £3 per month. Um, every contribution, no matter how small it is, really does help us to continue doing the life-changing work that we do. Um, and we're also always on the lookout for corporate sponsors and volunteers for our event and fundraising activities um, and events. So um, at the moment, we're planning a cycle ride across Tanzania um, later this year. So if you're interested in this or any of the other events that we might hold, um, or just interested in our projects and what we do, feel free to come and chat to me at the end or any of my colleagues around the room. Um, so today's lecture will be delivered to you by Matthew and Max from Eliza Morrison um, and also Peter, the founder of the Microloan Foundation. Um, and they'll be talking to you about their training centre in Malawi for the Microloan Foundation. Um, their talk will last around 35 minutes uh, and after that will we'll be followed by a panel discussion and um, an opportunity for questions and answers. So before I hand over, um, I just want to say thanks to Eliza Morrison for hosting us in their beautiful office space um, and thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many of you here um, and yeah, if you could help me welcome um, our speakers to the stage. Thank you, Kieran, and thank you for, to Article 25 for the invite to, to speak this evening. Um, as Kieran said, we're going to be talking about the Michael Training Centre today, and we're also going to talk about the design process and the construction process. We really wanted to get to grips with the purpose behind the building, so it's great we've got Peter here this evening, the founder of Michael as well, uh, I wanted to hand over to Peter briefly to kind of introduce some about the background to the building, how the building came about, uh, and then we'll, then we'll sort of work through and look at the construction process and the design process. Um, so we'll hand yeah, over to Peter briefly. Yeah, perfect. Now, I, I see a, a dreadful word up on the slide there, inspirational. So I'm rather apprehensive about kicking this off. The, the Mike Cologne Foundation um, actually started in 2002 uh, in, in Malawi. And what, what we do is that we concentrate on helping poor women who live in the rural areas who basically haven't got anything. And we try to give them something. And the something that we give them is effectively 
a chance to start a business because if they can start a business and earn money, it will pay for food on the table, it will pay for education for their kids, it will pay for school uniforms, it will pay for medicines, you know, simple medicines uh, which, without which they would die. And the methodology we have is that we, we go into the rural communities and we build relationships and we form the women into groups um, and we um, register a bank account for them as the group and we train them. And while we're training them, they save a bit of money and then eventually they have their loan. And the loan in Malawi will be very small, about £45, and it will be for a period of three to four, three to four months. And they create these life-changing businesses. Now, one of our businesses, which actually came about probably in the first year of operation, we lent £25 to a woman in a place called Nkota Kota, which was actually the centre of slavery in the mid-1800s. And she used her £25 to buy a fishing net, which she used to catch fish off the shore. And then she sold those fish in the marketplace. And the profits from that she used to buy a fishing boat. Then she bought an outboard with a fishing boat. Then she bought two more fishing boats and employed people. And then she built a shop and a house and so on and so forth. And in fact, when I was last talked to her about two years ago, she was actually helping uh, with all her employees' independence, about 160 people. And she only had a loan at that point of £100. So microfinance is extremely powerful. Um, we get 97, 98% of the money back. But training is what makes the whole programme a success. Um, um, and because without training, people don't know what to do with the money you give them. Uh, they, they don't know how to use it, how to use it wisely. So... We developed a training programme, but we wanted to have a building in which we could do more training, train our staff and train our clients as well. And as often the way these things happen, I met somebody in my local community who happened to be a partner in Allies and Morrison. And he said, ah, I think we can help you. And so really that was the way this project started. It was about a bit of, syn a bit of synchronicity. And just before um, we talk about the design of the building, um, just to say that from that small start in 2002 to this day, uh, the charity is operating in three countries, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe. And we've helped over a million people in that, in that time, all from making these small loans. And so the, you know, the project is going well. And this training centre is fundamental to helping us drive our growth. That's great. Thank yep. you, Peter. Okay. <coughs> so... I won't go through these numbers in detail, but these are the numbers that Peter sent through of just the impacts that uh, Michael Owen has made in Malawi, uh, and then in 2018 as well, and then across the three countries uh, that, that uh, Michael Owen works in. So it's, it's sort of doing a really vital job in these different countries, uh, and it was a great opportunity to be able to work with Peter on a project which could help with the training uh, and supporting this work. Peter briefly explained there, generally the, the way the loan loans work is that a group of women in a rural area will form a, uh, a small group where they work together, they have training together, and they really operate as a, as a little business and enterprise in themselves. Uh, and those units, they, they're, they're sort of multiplied across uh, many different uh, places in and around Kasungu and Malawi. So just, just sort of focusing in on the brief, so when we met Peter, he, he came to us uh, with a site, uh, and it was quite a open brief it was a, a training center with support accommodation and at the time there was an idea about other phases for the project as well with potentially a guest house and, and various other things on the site but we really focused in on this um, training center you can see from the dates it actually goes back to 2007 when we first started the project uh, and completed the project on site in March 2011 so that's, it was quite a long process to, to get the, the project built and there was a whole fundraising process which Peter would no doubt be able to layer on more, more kind of detail about that. Um, but what it gives us even is an opportunity to really see something that was completed in 2011, and we've got some more recent photographs now to see actually what it looks like today to try to understand how it's, how it's uh, performed. So Malawi, probably most people know where that is, but it's in southeastern Africa. Um, and it's really a country that's running north-south along the Rift Valley uh, and obviously sort of dominated by Lake Malawi. It is a, is a big feature in the country, and that's, it's a really beautiful uh, country, a beautiful landscape. Um, 
The capital of Malawi is Lilongwe, just here. And the site itself, where, where, we, where Peter was working with, his, with uh, Michael Owen Foundation, was in Kasungu, which is about 80 kilometres northwest of uh, Lilongwe. It was actually on a, a plateau higher up, so the Rift, the Rift Valley is running through here, and Kasungu is about 1,300 metres above sea level. So whilst it's quite close to the equator because of the elevation, it's got still a very hot climate, but not as hot as it, as it could be. And it's got a rainy season between November and April. Um, this is the entrance to the uh, Microloan offices at, as, as we started when we started the project uh, with a high, high wall around the site. And you can see the entrance there to the uh, offices as they, as they were at that time. And that's the, the site plan. So it's quite a simple uh, site outline a fairly flat site with a bit of a fall towards, towards the north. But you can see the existing office, office here was constructed really in a lot of ways, buildings were constructed in Malawi as the client almost engages themselves as a main contractor and builds the building themselves, paying for materials, uh, bringing in labour as they need. And the, the design here, which I think was one of the things that Peter briefed us on uh, to try to do differently, had a central corridor and it's quite a warren of sort of rooms mm -hmm. off, off that. And that, that, was the, that was the building on site as it, as it was. And that's just a view looking back towards the entrance. So I was going to hand over to Max just to talk about the local buildings and the materials because we, th yeah, they, they were the two things that really influenced the design uh, from our perspective. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. Hello everyone, I'm Max. So um, I was lucky enough to go out on the first visit. We did two visits. I did the first one, Matt did the second one. And essentially, as you can imagine, that completely transformed our view of what the design should be, what materials we should be using, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, I think we were looking, thinking back over the project. We tend, I think the project was tended prior to the first, my first visit, and actually it radically changed the, the, the specification of the project because we knew what was available. And before that, it was, um, it was very, very, uh, very, very difficult to understand really what was appropriate. Um, and we managed to get the tenders down to a reasonable level, level at the second stage. So I'm just going to touch on... Touch on, I'll touch, we'll touch on all of that a little bit later. I'm just going to explain a bit of the context. context. And one of the reasons why Microloan Foundation are there is, or operate in Malawi is, is really a very, very uh, 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 rural um, uh, uh, country uh, with uh, levels of uh, poverty, um, uh, which are even for Africa quite severe. And uh, development is, is, is very, very limited, and in, uh, in particularly in Kasungu, away from the, the main cities, Kasungu is is uh, a, a relatively major town, but the, the building quality and the general building stock is, is, is generally quite low, as you'd expect. And there are three types of buildings. This is kind of the medium. They kind of go from straw huts, essentially, mud huts, really, to, to, to simple brick buildings like these. Um, ooh, sorry. Uh, to, at the other end of the spectrum, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, um, this type of building, of which there's a few, and essentially the, the office building that... Um, microloan still still occupy uh, was very very similar with a kind of crinkly tin roof uh, system roof and 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 rendered and with a with a veranda often often in in quite unusual locations or unexpected uninspected uh, unexpected, uh, unexpected location but um, uh, um, I think the brief was really to move away a little bit from that as Matt has suggested and try and do something uh, with the design uh, that was a little bit more inspirational, a little bit more uh, um, f a focus for the for the charity. This was their this is their headquarters still in Manawi, and the training centre was intended to be a public facing, representative building. Um, it's a modest building, albeit a, a modest building, but it's still different from many of the other buildings. And we thought we'd just show you some of the photos um, of, of some of the visits, and uh, these are actually sort of the one a photographer went out as well and took some photos and. Uh, of, of local shop fronts and, and really, really a lot of variety through colour and ornamentation. But essentially, this every building follows a, the similar kind of logic with a uh, particularly public facing building. So these are all along the high street with a veranda, shaded kind of veranda, often um, uh, some, some security to the windows uh, and, and then uh, using colour to, to, to create quite um, wonderful kind of... Uh, 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 decoration to the building, and um, uh, but using very very minimal minimal material. So that was really our kind of our starting point, our inspiration for for for, for the for the for the building itself. Um, and, and the other inspiration was really the materials. And as I said, the kind of outline design happened a little bit earlier, um, prior to the visit. But on the visit itself, we it really transformed our approach to materials and. 
fortunate enough to go and uh, be taken around by a local surveyor. We'd identified beforehand someone, a kind of a local architect stroke surveyor who was able to kind of show us what was available locally uh, uh, and, and where, where it could be obtained and what the kind of typical um, uh, and standard kind of sizes were for various elements. And here you can see brickwork, brick being made all over the country. Uh, uh, and one of the downsides of, of the way that, uh, and that very available material, the only material really that was being used, but obviously one of the downsides is that they were, they're all fired and, um, and, uh, and obviously use fire uh, uh, leading to some deforestation as a result. But you can see that the, so, um, all throughout in a very, very local, informal kind of economy um, and, and often involved multiple firings with the, the bricks in the centre being the ones that reached the right temperature and therefore the right um, strength and then the ones on the, on the edges had to be refired again. Um, we did look into using mud bricks, but it was, um, it was just the availability was, you know, it would have been a really nice idea from in terms of carbon uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, the, the no need for firing would have been great, but there was really no infrastructure for that, and very little precedent and very little local skills able to build a structure of that kind. So we did, we did, we, we went with what was common, uh, i.e. brick. Uh, we also looked at other kind of materials. Um, uh, we tried to avoid using any um, imported materials and try to use as many materials that could be made locally. So we used a lot of uh, uh, the shuttering for security p reasons uh, was, uh, uh, was welded locally using using the uh, um, uh, standard section sizes. And this is, these are not our, our shutters, but these are examples of the shutters that were just being made on the street. Timber available locally. Um, uh, um, um, and I'll come, there's an interesting story about the timber because that had a massive impact on the price as we discovered through the tender process. Um, and here I just point, point the, these are this obviously some windows being manufactured, timber windows. So we, end, we, had to, we ended up with timber windows and doors. It's a local landmark, which is Kasungu Hill. Uh, uh, in a generally relatively flat landscape, rolling, uh, ro shallow rolling hills. This is kind of major landmark, which um, uh, is, makes the place very identifiable. And then lastly, uh, materials relating particularly to, to, to its uh, location on the lake. We ended up um, using reed and actually be interested to find out from Peter if that reed, we use it as a seeding material, whether that is standing the test of time. Still it's still there. Good, good. You'll see it later in some photos. Um, and we also uh, uh, visited uh, perhaps a little bit more uh, a niche um, uh, uh, production facility for tiles uh, uh, on the lake. So that's a, 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 a little small business, um, not supported through Microloan, micro but um, uh, nevertheless quite successful. I think they've since moved, but they produced uh, tiles locally to a slightly higher quality than, than perhaps the uh, uh, available elsewhere. Uh, potteries, and I think they also produced... Um, um, pottery itself as well. And so we procured the floor tiles and sill tiles from, from there, um, um, again, n not very far away as well. Um, and also um, uh, uh, the roof covering, which what we did not go down the crinkly tin uh, option, which would have been the kind of natural choice. Um, this was a slightly difficult decision. <laughs> but, uh, and again, there were some challenges, but it was a, it's a very um, interesting material. I'll let Matt, Matt explain. The, these, these roof tiles um, are basically low cement roof tiles, so they, both in terms of the profile and the process of making them, means that they're very unreliant on heavy amounts of cement within the manufacture process. Um, what it means is that then we're not reliant on lots of imported materials, so we're really trying to use local materials. So this, this just to briefly sort of go through the stages of making these, the, this is the aggregate which is sifted from uh, Lake Malawi into different grades. That's then mixed. Sorry about this. That's then mixed. And then it's, it's placed as a slurry on this vibrating plate uh, on that rubber mould at the bottom. And then it's slid off onto these moulds at this point here. And then you can see there the profile of the roof tile being made. So it's a lot of using a lot of local labour, uh, trying, to, trying to sort of use local labour rather than metal sheets. Those are left to cure in the air first, but then they're actually finally cured in, a, in these water baths externally, in the, in the external environment. Um, so yeah, just, just now thinking about design development. I think from the start, this is one of the, the partners who worked on the project, uh, one of the early sketches. We were really trying to understand how can you create shade, uh, external circulation for the building, which really contributes to the character of the building. And these are really early first sketches, and it's very simple really. How do you create a very simple uh, box but with a, a shaded element to the walls and the roof but then tweaking that really to see how you could perhaps make a bit more of a delicate roof profile that edged that so 
the aspiration was to create something really, really good, but actually very simple uh, in reality. So this, this is the plan which we saw earlier on, where there was an empty site previously, and the entrance is still at this point here. Um, and what, what we set up really was a, a very simple uh, linear building running through here, and three and four uh, very, very simple flexible training spaces. Because at the time when we were working with, this, with Peter, we weren't sure of the specific uses. So we wanted to try to keep it very flexible so, this, so we didn't build a building that wasn't any use later. And th those sizes are about the size of a classroom in the, in the UK, around about 45 to 50 square metres. Uh, and they can be configured in many different ways. Um, but very simply, the, the circulation here is actually on the outside. So it's a, a simple shaded uh, colonnade on the outside. And each classroom opens out. The doors fold back onto that colonnade here. But they also have dual aspect for cross ventilation as well on the back. And then the, in the brief, we did also need things like toilets and uh, kitchens. So we uh, organised those around this entrance or route through the building. And that, that route through the building kind of broke up the mass of that length of the building. Uh, but also there was an idea that there'd be a second phase. So we we're trying to create the opportunity really to link through to a new project at, at the back here. Um, so when we developed that for, for tender, we, we then got down into much more detail. We worked with Akira engineers and Max Fordhams. And we obviously got into grids. Uh, this was on a, about a three meter grid, but we, we set everything out to local brick dimension. So the actual sort of tender drawings went into quite a, quite a lot of detail. Um, on the elevation, I've got some 3D views in a moment, but it, we, we set up a very simple set of uh, doors which could really fold back against the elevation, uh, but with high level windows in this location here, providing daylight deep into the, into the space. So yeah, just reflecting on what Max was saying about the materials, this, this diagram really kind of shows the kind of evolution of that and how that ended up in the, in the design, all those different elements. So you know, really starting from a simple concrete slab, uh, we have brickwork walls, uh, and then this uh, sort of painted <coughs> elevation at the front, and then there, there are a series of layers then in timber, uh, and then the roof tiles coming on top. Uh, and then in the elevation, again, it was layered up to deal with issues of ventilation. So I'll show on a section in a moment, we had nighttime ventilation to cooling at night. But also security was a big issue. So integrating the steel screens in a way that didn't uh, kind of make the building feel aggressive was, was a real uh, challenge for the building. So at this stage, we got to this. This is an early sketch of, of how we kind of envisaged the, the building coming together. And then at a more detailed level in, in section. Again, it's quite a simple cross-section with a, a mono-pitch roof, uh, but providing shade at this end, but obviously the deep colonnade here providing shade here and diffuse light and high light dropping through in, into the workshop and training space here. Um, we actually had uh, glazed, glazed louvers here, which also had horizontal bars in. What that meant was those louvers could be opened at night uh, and left open at night and they wouldn't pose a security issue. Um, and then in, in the other areas, we had the exposed quarry tiles, uh, for thermal mass um, and then as in a lot of uh, the projects that have been in this series a very high threshold at this point about 300 millimeters because of the rainfall and a little lip there down to the detail to avoid termites coming up into the building so there's a there's a lip at that point um, and one other thing on the roof construction is we had the low cement uh, concrete tiles on the top uh, but we had this ventilated void in between here with vents at either end so obviously when the, when the sun's hitting the roof rather than going directly and radiating into the space, it's actually ventilated up through the roof profile at this point. It's also worth adding the re one of the reasons for going with the, the tiles, um, although they're a relatively novel material, was, was precisely that for avoiding that kind of heat and also noise that you get in the rainy season from, from the, that you get on a, on a metal roof. And if there are quiet activities going on in the training rooms, it was felt that it helped kind of offset that noise and, uh, and the heat. Yeah. These are our early sort of sketch up views, uh, which Peter was using to sort of fundraise on this basis uh, for, for the project before, before it got built. And then just a little bit more detail on, on the typical colonnade. So these are the types of drawings we actually had in our tender <coughs> documentation eventually. So sort of elevational base studies and more detailed mm -hmm. proportions and, and, and specification relating to this. Um, on the construction, so I hand over to you, Max. So I'm going to talk a little bit about procurement and then we'll, uh, and the construction. This is actually a really interesting part of the project, and I know something that you know the lessons learned for for, for Peter and uh, and for us is 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 um, some of the challenges we faced at the time. So um, as I was saying earlier, it went to 
there were two tenders uh, and the first tender came back outrageously high and we weren't quite sure why and um, but once we drilled down we realized that, that the, the, the allowances that would be made for certain materials were were phenomenally high and that's simply because we hadn't at that stage that was prior to a visit we didn't we hadn't really sized uh, the structural timbers appropriately or, or really anything all the materials that we'd specified or, or suggested were um, were not entirely appropriate so we were but it was a really really helpful exercise because we were able to go through with a with a really fine tooth comb and look at because uh, we'd requested uh, 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 bills of quantities to go through with a really fine tooth comb and do essentially value engineering. So we realised one of the, the big ticket items, and there were many, many issues, but one of the big, big ticket items was, uh, was anything larger than 150 mil deep for, uh, as a timber, piece of timber, anything bigger than 150 was, uh, was returned in the tenders as glue lamb. So we'd had this, you know, the structure designed by Akira engineers, all the timbers sized up, and there were many 200, 250 sized timbers, which are, you know, readily available in the UK as saw cut timbers. But out in Malawi, anything over 150, they go to glue lamb straight away. And glue lamb, as you can see, the cost per linear meter, it's like tenfold. Um, uh, and, and we'd ended up essentially with, with the secondary, the primary and secondary <laughs> roof structure, all this glue lamb, just because we weren't, weren't aware that, the, and, and the, you know, the contractors had just taken it as red, that all the timbers needed to be that depth, so therefore they'd priced it as glue lamb. So it was a really, really helpful process. One of the downsides was that it drew, took the, the process was a little bit more drawn out because we had to go through the, a second tender stage essentially, where we re redesign the building and, re and value engineered it essentially looking at all the potential savings that we could make to make it more cost effective. Um, that was a slightly helpful exercise the, the, um, uh, and, and incredibly value, valuable. It should be, the, the, other, the other issue that we face is, is that it was the procurement route, route that was chosen and I, I don't know, we can talk about whether Peter would do it differently but interestingly the first office that you looked at there that we saw, the first building that, they, uh, that Microloan also built on that site was procured the way all other buildings locally are procured in the sense the client buys all the materials and, and then buys in the labour almost on a daily basis, you know, gets in the bricklayers and, and buys in the windows and, and is essentially acts as a, as a main contractor. And that's obviously a really onerous thing to do. And it also means that the kind of level of quality that you can get um, uh, is, is really reliant on the kind of labour that's available and, and what materials are available. So you're really, really dependent on kind of a very um, um, uh, kind of narrow kind of supply chain. And also it just means you've got to have you've got to have the capacity to run it. You've got to have the capacity to essentially project manage your own, your own uh, uh, building. So um, in this case, uh, Michael and I decided to go to a main contractor and that did unfortunately result in a premium. It meant that essentially you were, you know, like you would any project in the UK, we went out to tender uh, to, to a number of main contractors and um, uh, with, I think we brought on some advice from a property consultant who was able to advise on and that they often weren't necessarily local, I don't think, uh, I can't remember where the main contractor, I think the main contractor was based in, in Lulongwe and um, of a lot of their, the labour ended up being local labour but they were actually based in Lulongwe because simply there wasn't really a market for main contracting um, so much but it did and, and I think it did result in a premium uh, but it did mean that ultimately you could get you, you, you were able to hand over the, the construction of the project largely by and large to a main contractor who um, who then came on board and, 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 and they, did, they did work relatively efficiently and quickly. We tried to, uh, um, to find a way of working and initially, we should also point out, we tried to find a way of working where we could work more closely with a, a local architect and we, because we didn't originally envisage that we would do quite as much and it'd be interesting to hear what, you know, people's, Article 25's experience but other people's experience, uh, because we were hoping that we might be able to do a kind of outline concept design and then work with a local architect, and this is actually the local architect that was uh, uh, was um, suggested to us, recommended to us, and I met on my visit. Who's incredibly helpful, and you know show, showed me all the various materials and where, where materials would come from, and and how things would. But ultimately, wasn't really didn't have that capacity to 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 act to, to well didn't have a the drawing capacity didn't, didn't just couldn't understand what we were trying to achieve uh, nor did he have the kind of communication capacity and kind of authority to really translate that on site so it was a didn't quite work out for us well, interesting what did happen is that a member of uh, Peter's team a chap called Julius who I think was financial uh, 
controller. He, turned, he actually ended up managing the building project really for, on site and was excellent and his English skills were very good, his English language was very good which helped and he essentially became your project manager on site and that communication worked very well but it wasn't how we'd kind of originally kind of anticipated or hoped it might work out. Um, so I'll hand over to Matt at this point to talk a little bit about on site. So yeah, just, just talk a little bit about the on site process. So I, I had the opportunity to visit on the second time uh, and what, what the, the point I was visiting, they were just really setting out the project on site. So it was the first month within the site process. And so what we were doing, we were really trying to set up all the processes, the procurement uh, with a contractor. So it sort of, it ran very much, as you might imagine, a project in the UK running. You try to use all the same things, so agendas, meeting minutes, programmes, procurement schedules. We were using all these things in a, in a kind of same way uh, as, as we would have done. We were, we were treating it really as a you know, a, a full-on project here. Um, and after that, after that had got up and running, we were then, I was back in the UK, and the, the challenge there was really to kind of monitor the project on, on site. And the way we ended up working was, these were site photos that were emailed to us, and we would then send comments back on those site photographs in conjunction with Julius, who was actually on the ground as well. So it's quite a bit of an evolving process in terms of trying to establish a form of practice to, to manage it on site. But you can see it was a very labour-intensive uh, process on site, not a lot of mechanisation, as, as you expect. Um, and th these, these are just showing some of really the sort of stages of, of the process of the construction coming on and the render coming onto the building. And we were really involved with a sort of nitty-gritty and a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. So this is a sketch on the left, really, where we're looking at all the kind of roof straps and how they worked and where you, where you couldn't see them uh, for, this, for this piece of the roof where it meets the the gable wall at that, that point. So it was actually a lot of detail under the, under the, under the surface to, to deal with. And that sort of played out really across the different elements <coughs> of the building as, as it progressed. So it, we sort of established this pattern of working where we would send markups on, you know, almost once a week, uh, looking at progress and, and trying to see how things were emerging and picking up different things, sometimes bigger things, sometimes smaller things, but trying to really make sure the kind of intent, the original intent was, was maintained and the communication kept, was, was keeping going really on a day-to-day on -day basis. And then this is one of the finished photographs uh, which, which we had taken and the columns which Max touched on here were a sort of whole design exercise in themselves in terms of establishing the, the kind of uh, appropriate timber dimensions for those but then actually being able to joint those was, was quite a process so there was a whole sort of uh, series of details which we produced looking at the different joints and the different conditions so that we could use very standard uh, timber lengths which are available locally and the metal components which we work with on a, with Akira engineers could be made locally as well quite quite easily as well so we managed to produce something that was a little bit more complex by piecing together a whole series of quite simple uh, uh, elements and could be sourced and made locally as well I think, I think we actually adjusted the height of the building exactly to correspond to the longest bit of timber that you could get um, because otherwise we would have had to go glue lamb which would have added obviously a lot to the cost. In the end we only, only ended up with I think three or four glue lamb beams which you can kind of see, see there um, just running, running across so, um, and all the others were 150. That's why the timbers are quite slender to the columns because they're 150. Yeah, and that's, you can see obviously the, the, the kind of parallel lengths of timber there. Um, yeah, and that, that you know, sort of all the base detail connections, and then we're sort of monitoring that on site as well. And that's a, a view along the colonnade, looking back to the existing building. Um, also, what we did, just as a final layer, as the building was coming to completion, we worked with our model shop and workshop here. Uh, we produced the signage for uh, the classroom, so there's four <coughs> workshops, and we produced this signage here, uh, which got fitted, and we managed to speak to D-Line to donate some lettering here, which was sent out. Uh, and was, was placed onto the building as well at that point, and that's some of the completed photographs. So just to sort of wrap up, really, I think the most interesting bit is probably how, how has the actual building been useful? How has it been used? Has it been a success or not? So th these are some of the photographs of that, showing the different uh, configurations of the, of the building in use, um, the interiors, and Peter will probably be able to give us more information on this, but um, really you can see how the different configurations are working, so sometimes it's for a seminar space or a group meeting uh, or a presentation in, in, in this case, uh, at the front. And then this is the most recent set of photographs which was just taken a, a week or so ago because uh, we, we kind of just wanted to see how, how the building had weathered 
And you, so that's, I mean, I'll let that speak for itself, but you can see the timber colour has changed there. But generally, I think it, it's weathered fairly well because it's quite a harsh tropical climate uh, that, that, that's there. And then that's just really the final slide to say thank you very much to the team who worked with us uh, in, to create the project. So that's great. Thank you. So thank you very much to Matthew, Max and Peter for a really interesting and empowering lecture. It was a great insight into the challenges of building a humanitarian project abroad. Um, so we now have time for a panel discussion with audience participation. So feel free to ask any questions. Um, and after the Q&A, there's some time for networking. So um, feel free to stay in the space until nine when we have to leave. Um, so our panel today consists of Matt, Peter and Max, as well as B. Senewald, the Director of Projects at Article 25. Thank you, Kieran. It's an amazing presentation, really beautiful building. I'm sure everyone here really appreciated it and how it could go from a small something that starts in small packages of loans of 45 pounds to a beautiful building like that, that then let so many people start their own businesses is really quite amazing. And I'm, I was wondering while I was looking at the, the pictures first of the plans and then of the actual people using the building, what sort of training do they get there? Well, the, the clients get training about how to run their businesses, how to save money, so they don't, when they earn money, they, uh, they save their profits, so they don't just spend them on blindness, cons endless consumption, so they can reinvest in their businesses. They get taught how to support one another when things go wrong, because inevitably in Africa things do go wrong because people are living on the edge. And if something goes wrong, you want members of the group to help the other members who are in a good position, or help people who are in a worse position. So that's, that's a very important thing. And then we train our clients, obviously, how to, um, how to work with us as an organisation how to understand all our processes and procedures, how to go into the bank uh, to, pick up, to pick up money, how to go into the bank to pay back money in, and, and so on and so forth. We train our staff how to, how to, um, how to um, go out and work in the field. We have a, a big social performance management department which is based in that building. Social performance management spends a lot of time um, measuring the impact of what we do on the ground uh, and it's done in a way which is um, very independent so we, me we measure people's wealth levels through asking a whole series of indirect questions and that aspect of it gets driven right into the day-to-day -day operational activities of, 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 of the organisation. We have lots of group training sessions in, in that building uh, whether it's to do with IT, whether it's management meetings but I think, one thing, I think one of the things I can't really describe about that building is that, by God, it makes everyone feel good. It's, it's such a good building. Um, and it, it just reminds me, when I see the pictures and the processes we went through to get there, and I can remember the construction and the designs and the first pictures which I saw, saw there again, brought it all back. But actually, on a day-to-day -day basis, when you walk into that big compound, which I bought, for I think about 500 quid, all the land we've got there, I spent 500 quid, and I, I left the space for this training centre just in case. <laughs> and I knew it would happen one day. And uh, you know, everybody feels good. Um, we have parties there. We, we have 120 staff in Malawi. So we will pull people there and have massive discos and um, <laughs> plenty of bottles of this and the rest <laughs> of it. And it's sort of all part of celebrating the end of the year or, or important events in the charity's life. So it's, it actually it's an important building for us um, yeah. yeah thank you yeah that was quite elucidating because uh, a lot of us um, are not familiar with how microloans work probably a lot of people in the audience to really understand how you can make a lot out of a little and get it to multiply itself yeah. and get different members of a group support each other which are all, all really quite important 
And it's true that they're, they're jointly responsible, the members of the group are jointly responsible for the repayment, yeah. is that the case? That is the case, they're, joint, they're jointly responsible, but they all run their own individual businesses. So the business, I didn't describe the businesses, but they're all simple trading businesses, buying and selling rice, buying and selling a big drum, buying a big drum of oil, and then dividing it up into mini sachets and selling it to the rural communities in your, in your community network. You know, rearing pigs or rearing goats, uh, setting up roadside cafes, which we loosely would call tea, sh tea shops, a whole variety of activities. And in, those, in that slide you saw there um, some women being trained on knitting and sewing. Uh, that was a, a project which uh, well, I initiated because I wanted to do something value added. And we brought it back in from that original small training centre which uh, was shown and put it in the main building. And it, the business developed and they were exporting these sewn garments back into the UK and back into the United States, which from a little, you actually sort of put that in context of these poor people living in rural, in rural environment, they've suddenly been given sewing machines, they've been, been taught how to sew, and they've been given some designs, and they were putting them together, and they were selling them. But actually after a while we decided, after about two years after that picture, we decided it was getting too big. So we sp handed it over to somebody else to run on a more professional basis. And I think, I think it's an organisation in the UK called Karma. And uh, they did the design and they did the marketing of it. Terrific success, yeah, isn't it? Is, yeah. yeah. When you can how, spin how it off. How many staff do they have in, do you know how many they've got in Malawi now? I would think, probably, they're still quite, I mean, probably about 20 people, I would mm. think, something like that. It's not big, but it's quite high profile. You go to the duty free in the airport lounge, you'll see their goods there. So it's quite an achievement, actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think quite uh, a lot of people here are probably architects or engineers and curious about the building itself. And one question I was asking myself, seeing your details and your sketches during construction, how would you compare the level of effort of this to, um, say, a primary school in the UK that might be of a similar scale? What, what would you, how would you compare the two? I think part of the joy of the project was just the simplicity. I mean, the environmental conditions aren't are so, so different that the, you know, the, the air permeability isn't really, in fact, you want to encourage it and, right. and, uh, uh, and uh, you, you don't really need any insulation to, to I mean, there's, you've got to address solar gain issues and the, the heat, but you don't, do, you don't face quite, so actually just, what, you know, just a single brick wall, it's all, it's all really, really, simple um, and that, I think that was the part of the joy of the project was just being able to, uh, uh, to, to think, think uh, of, of, of how you could create something that's beautiful but uses things coming together in a very very simple, um, simple and, 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 uh, uh, but yet beautiful fashion. I think that was partly what one of the, and sometimes projects these, in, particularly in yeah, uh, nowadays can, can be incredibly complicated and procurement routes can be so complicated and uh, uh, and that, uh, that sometimes you lose that sense of the whole mm -hmm. and you're involved in a very small aspect and it might be quite technical and often you don't quite understand how everything's coming together and here the great thing really was understanding it could, you know being able to understand the whole building really in five minutes and kind right. of uh, I think that was kind of part of the joy of the and project. there was a lot of immediacy probably in the photographs coming back from site we we have the same in at article 25 where every morning we have about 10 pictures on WhatsApp or from mm. one or another of our sites. And we go, oh, oh no, that's not like that. And then <coughs> you send the sketches back and the more WhatsApp pictures are coming and everybody, including the engineers, everybody is in the group. And it is really quite amazing. It's this virtual design community that functions very well while the project is on site. Yeah, I think we found that worked well, didn't it, on that, that approach? I mean, that just happens kind of uh, just evolved naturally, but yeah, yeah, yeah just to sort of evolve nat that that process of sending things backwards and forwards. But it's it's very obvious, really, to, to do that. I guess in the end, that you just got to communicate yeah. and find the best way to do that. So, but it is always reliant on having someone at the other end who can understand what you're saying and understand the sketches yes. and then translate those to, to on site. And was that Julius in your case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think so. I mean, I think certainly. I don't know if he was involved all the way through, but for a large yeah, part was, of the yeah. project, he was, yeah. he was fundamental. I mean, I, I think it would I, th been I think actually, in hindsight, you know, doing that project, Malawi is probably one of the most difficult places to do it. One of, mainly for one of the reasons you said, you couldn't find somebody who was good, who was an architect, who could communicate and manage the process. 
there is a, is a dearth of very good, well-educated people who want to do that sort of work. Um, so yeah, it is challenging. Plus all the challenges of the raw materials. Right. Well, we face exactly the same issue, and we send someone out. Yeah. That one person. Everybody else is local, and everybody else mm. learns their skills on site. But that one person is needed to understand um, the sketches and understand how it should be built, uh, or it's um, every little thing goes wrong when you have to do it two or three. How, how are they there for the duration? For, yes. For the well, or maybe not the same person, but because, somebody. Yeah. Because yes. we were only. I mean, I was there for a week. You were there for. I don't know how long you were there for. A week as well. A week as well. That no, was, the duration is what was, you need. You, yeah, yeah. That was that was that was it. And then it was all but done we, remotely. But we had the design. Didn't, when you went when you went there, the design was there, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I, w I would say that if I was to say anything, in hindsight, it's easy to say in hindsight, in the ideal world, it would be nice to make the trip before any design was done. Because... This is very important. Because, 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 because actually, then you can, you know, get into grips with all the issues you, we discovered later, which is the size of the timbers, the difficulties of the people, and all that sort of thing. And, and I think actually that's quite an important thing about doing anything in developing countries based on my experience with setting up the Mike Plan Foundation is actually the more research you can do before you do anything, the better it's always going to be. Because I think as, you, as Europeans, and, and don't get this in the wrong way, I don't, I don't mean that, is actually it, it, we, still, we still are fueled by a good dose of colonialism that we think we know best. And in fact, sometimes we do, but very often we don't. <laughs> right. So that was the reason why we always said in our charity, yeah, yeah, yeah. spend a lot of time asking the questions <laughs> because they're no experts, but maybe the experts are actually out there in, 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 in the rural communities or wherever. Yeah. How about some questions from you? You must be wondering. Um, um, do we have a microphone to send around? Because it's quite large room. Oh, I can probably speak louder. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Shout. Um, so I think the project's really great um, and I actually really uh, think the simpleness is commendable mm -hmm. and also the fact that you guys stuck to your role as architect and didn't kind of try and adopt a kind of build a role within the project which I think often happens with humanitarian projects um, and what I was actually wondering is the local builders who worked on site did any of the kind of quite simple techniques using local materials that were kind of new to the area and not seen in local architecture, have they been used since? Or are you still in contact with those builders? Well, um, I'm actually, no, we're not in contact with those builders because it was a one-off project. Um, uh, and I would imagine some of those techniques probably are used, but I've got, you know, it's, that would just be intuitive. Intuitive thought. I know the building was a bit of a step out for what they would normally do. So if you looked at Kasungu now, and the, which is the place, the town in which that building is based, it's a, it's a one-off building. Right. It, it, it carries clout because of the shape of it and the feel of it. I think it was for the, for the potteries who supplied the, the low cement tiles uh, and, and the floor, quarry tiles on the floor and the sills, I think it was a pretty big order. Yes. And it took actually it affected the program. I seem to remember that it because every single one was individually made and then cured, and so there was quite a long lead time in getting. And I think for them it was probably. I mean, it certainly helped um, uh, future. You know, f uh, keep their business going. I think they've since moved, but I think they're still still there, still operating. Still yeah. operating because they were quite an unusual. Um, uh, what they were offering was quite unusual, and quite niche, and quite small. And I think certainly the the big order helped to kind of boost their kind of business and, and hopefully off the back of this they would have had other orders for, uh, for, for, for the tiles and for the roof tiles, We're not, we don't know but they're still going which is positive. I think it would be very interesting to see how kind of small moves like that, so maybe using uh, the floor tiles to that extent or using the cement tiles to that extent can actually have a traceable impact within the community so other people adopting those techniques, I'm not quite sure how you'd implement that but those small simple techniques mm. are the ones that can actually pass on so. I think one of the things we've tried to do is take wherever possible local techniques but just perhaps scale them up a little bit so you have a slightly bigger volume for the brickwork than you might get on a standard building in Kasungu. But so we try to do things like that. So some of the techniques were actually locally, very much locally embedded, but we've just used them in a slightly different way, I think, as well. I think one of the things that I've found quite inspiring about what Mi Microloan does is, is the kind of level of professionalism that you bring to it. And actually it's you know that everyone who's involved is incredibly engaged but um but and and uh, but but 
uh, you know, incredibly respected in, in the careers that you offer for, 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 the, for the officers and for those working in the headquarters building. It's a really respected job, ultimately. And I think that's partly why that I think you wanted to go down the main contractor route, really to, to kind of help build capacities and to, mm -hmm. to, you know, things don't have to be done in the kind of quite hand-to-mouth way and you can, you know, be a bit more aspirational and professional about how you do things. So I, I do think that would have, that, that certainly, perhaps not just limited to the building process itself, but generally to your ethos and the way you work, that kind of, it has probably kind of raised aspirations for jobs in Kasungu and what, what you can do. Because the first, the first building, our head office, I, I met a, a guy and he sketched out what he wanted on the back of an envelope and put some measurements in and he said, how much will that cost? He gave me a price. I said, right, we're on. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> it was no, it was not, it was a, it was a non-architect's approach to building a building. <laughs> the thing is, the building's still up and it's still intact and it still doesn't leak, you know, so you can't, oh, cost, that cost is 10,000 pounds. <laughs> but the problem with this new building was that all the staff who were in the head office, as soon as it was open, said, right, when can we move in? <laughs> <laughs> There's some more questions that you might have. But yeah. Um, I'm actually from Zimbabwe, so it's great to see that Matt Cullen did some work over there as well. Yeah. Um, firstly, I was wondering, you guys, Alison Morrison, because you hadn't been there before you started designing, and obviously at Matt Cullen were based there, how did you manage to get your sort of I don't know, close to primary research based on the kind of structures that are there already, or what the environment's like, apart from? We did, I mean it's interesting you asked that, there was a, we did try to make contact with quite a few um, people who found it quite difficult um, in Blantyre, I think there were architects in Blantyre who were We'd been operating, but I think they'd gone and they'd, they'd, their business had, had um, they'd stopped trading, and uh, um, so we had we did try to forge links. But you're right. I mean, ultimately, what happened is we started the design process. Um, I'd say we kind of got to outline design stage, and at that stage, actually, there were plans for a guest house and for a second phase that were all kind of being tended on at the first. And the, but the design wasn't really particularly well developed. I think, um, uh, and after the visit, it completely. You know, it completely that allowed us to take it to that next level and really get down to the, every individual element and specify exactly every single material. Whereas beforehand, essentially, it was a, a an approximate plan and massing and uh, a, cr a crude ele a concept elevation, but really no more than that. And while it probably looked similar, every dimension changed after after we'd been out there. And every you know, the, as I was saying, the height of the building was adjusted to suit available timbers, every single element was, was changed. So we did, we relied, I think, I think it would have been a, a, a real, uh, uh, probably a failure if, if we hadn't, mm -hmm. uh, of the, if we hadn't actually had that moment where we could have gone out and done that, all that primary research and it wouldn't have worked. I think, you know, you have to kind of do, you have, you to, have really to be there, that. yeah. <laughs> but our original hope was actually not to, we were originally hoping we could find a local architect and partner with them and we might do the concept design and then kind of help you know, uh, help um, them implement our design intent, but that they would all do all the detailed drawings and the specification. That was our original intent. That was our hope that we could, but we just didn't find the rights. Um, we just, just weren't, they just weren't there. That was the, that was the, the, um, that was the, the, the thing that didn't quite work out as we'd hoped. So we did have to go out there and we had to do more drawings. And we, we did all the detailed drawings and we did the very, a very basic, but a specification after our visit. I don't know if you've got anything to add. No, no, we, uh, yeah, definitely. We struggled for a long time before Max first went out there to find out who exactly makes the windows, who makes the doors, what timbers you can get, what, what are the actual local brick dimensions. All those things really fed into producing a, a, a kind of tangible design. We thought, okay, we can... It's kind of fun to do all that, yeah. isn't it? To really get yeah. back to basics and figure it out. Yes, exactly. yeah. You had another question as well. No, I'm, yeah. I'm in you, yeah. Um, so I have a short question. Is what was the actual price at the end of the whole process and how much of the funds were actually uh, spent locally and where? The, the value, the cost of the building was um, in local terms, was, well it was £60,000 basically. Uh, was, uh, yeah, and all that money was spent locally. 
every single penny. How was it raised as well? Oh, it's just... Well, I had, the way, the way it worked was that I had one high net worth donor whose grandmother had died. And the grandmother was very keen on education and training. And so the lady who was running a quite an important financial services company said, I want to give you a grant for 50% of the building from, as a legacy from, from my grandmother. And so that was, a, that was a start. And then I happened to know somebody who lived in Chiswick who ran a foundation and um, who only gave money to buildings <laughs> from either in Zimbabwe, Malawi or Zambia. So we had a number of lengthy conversations, and um, he gave the rest. So that was the way it worked, yeah. So it was a donation based rather than a, let's say, a, a micro loan where you have to repay it back? No, it was, it was donation based. Actually, actually the, in the original concept, the original concept I had in mind when we wanted to have this training centre was that we would have a training centre on two levels. The tr there'd be a downstairs training centre, and on another level, upstairs, which would be a bed and breakfast, because there was a shortage of accommodation. And we alone as an organisation had so many people going down to do projects and other people coming in. We could have filled it many times over. But when we costed it up, because Malawi didn't have the templates to do two-storey two buildings because of the steel, they had to import all the steel, and that was mega, mega expensive, it would have added another 20, 30,000 pounds onto the cost of the building. So with some regret, we had to can the idea, um, and so we left it as a training centre. If we had we done that, we would have borrowed money to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, you mentioned several, several times a uh, possible second phase, um, and that the way you know, it's fantastic to see the way it's all grown in a relatively small period of time, the size of, of uh, macro and is now. Is there a second phase on the way? Is that, uh, we, we have actually we've done a, we have done a, a second phase Malawi style. Be, <laughs> behind that, behind the building, we built a massive storage capacity for all our documentation, which was done using the traditional methods. We didn't need anything particularly fancy to store documents. Um, so it's right behind that. It just blends in quite nicely. It's just a, um, a large building for storage, basically. Because as a microfinance organisation. Um, we didn't used to be, but as you get to scale, you get regulated by the reserve banks. And they come every year and spend at least one or two weeks auditing your books. And you have to have all your documentation, which can go back for years. So you need it. And do you think you'll throw beyond that into having a, another centre somewhere else in Malawi or elsewhere? Well, we were, we were thinking about building another, another actually head office in Zambia, uh, in, the, in the environment of, of um, Lusaka. But we decided not to do it because we actually decided we, got, we offered a very good building at a knockdown price, so we bought that instead. To, uh, yeah. So, but I, but I was seriously thinking of coming back and to say, <laughs> do you fancy? Do you fancy? Because we had a couple of donors who might have been interested, one of whom would have been, would have been some Japanese people. Yeah. I mean, in terms of funding, it's worth saying that I think having, at least having the visuals that we could help provide early on oh, did help yeah. a little bit with the kind of, with the fundraising at, at the time. Um, and I think that is, yeah. is one of the, it yeah. would have been more difficult had you done it Malawi style. To, but as it, to, to, as to it does in this country. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, as it does in this country. The artist's impression. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes. To raise the bank loan. Yeah. Yes, you have a question. Um, I had a question about uh, community consultation. So, uh, forming or involving sort of how did that happen with the women's groups who were training there with your staff? I was wondering, um, in talks with them, how much they were involved in the suggestions for design or what they would want. For, for, the, for, the, for this centre, yeah, yeah. actually, I have to admit it, even though I said what I just said about having a colonialist approach, the approach of this building from my side was a bit colonial. <laughs> Um, we, didn't, we didn't really consult them. We did consult our staff before we did it to get their views and got a lot of support and a few ideas. But we didn't go down as, as far as consulting the women. The actual community? Community women, that yeah. That you were working with. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. But, you know, I, 
But in terms of what we do as an organization, in terms of what they're doing, specific for the loans and the businesses, yes, we do. Yeah. Yes, there's another question. Um, I have two questions, sorry. Um, one is, what's the impression of the local people to the building when, they, when it opens? And how did you guys decide on who, de who had to design it together? Um, having visited at different times, how did you work that out? Well, to answer the first question, is everyone was knocked out by the building. I mean, even before it was built, but people looked at the designs and said, wow. Um, but when it, when, it's, when it was built, it was equally wow. And as I said earlier on, when you're there, you, and you're actually in the building, working in it, you know, or just walking past it in the veranda, it's a great building. It really is, actually. Um, it makes everyone who works there in that, in that compound very proud to be part of that organisation. In fact, they, the local staff, they built a little garden. It was not demonstrated by these photographers. Photographer in front and at the back, which is all done up on a regular, there's a professional gardener who comes in to look after it. With the title, there's a hedge built called Microland Foundation, just in front of the building, on a tilted, tilted bed, so you can see it. That's quite unusual for Malawi. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that is, is indicative of the pride. Yeah, I, it I is. definitely, when, you know, when meeting your staff, I just felt there was a huge pride in what you were doing and the kind of level of seriousness and professionalism you're bringing to it. And I think that kind of comes through. Yeah. And actually, some of the things we, we always talk about, the impact of the work that we do, helping the women. But then you, you, know, you, have, you have your staff come up to you and say, well, you know, if you hadn't come here and done this, and pay for this to help me to get further trained. I wouldn't have been able to pay for my kids to do X, Y, and Z. So there's a hell of a there's a hell of a big knock-on effect, right. which you don't really take a, account of. Yeah. I mean, I think in terms of the way Max and I work together, and the team within Allies and Morrison is very much because we're doing it in our spare time, mm -hmm. in the evenings and weekends and things. Often, it often depended on what project work we each had on. So often, if Max was really busy, I'd give it a push. If I was busy, Max would take over. So it seemed to work out quite well and the, the different we went we both visited independently but with very different purposes so they're quite complementary mm. visits so that worked out really well yeah. um yeah. one thing i'm curious about did you have any structural engineering support because this is in a very active earthquake zone well we yeah malawi we did we worked with the kira engineers who are, who are based in london right. um so yeah working very closely with them they were sizing all the timbers where we need straps, oh, you know, metal straps, straps and everything on there. So yeah, there's, pat there's, there's keystones for the glue lamp beams embedded into the wall, hidden behind the, the structure. So yeah, that was a, obviously we wanted to take that on board and make sure we got that right. We also had a little bit of input from Max Fordham, although that was relatively, it's relatively limited really. Um, but, but yeah, some, some, I think there's some very basic modeling around the kind of environmental engineering yeah. side. Because yeah. I think we were, one of our worries was, does, is the building gonna overheat? because um, it's got quite a high level of glazing which gives really good daylight but obviously with that you can have to often drag in so solar gain and I think I mean it'd be here, interesting to hear what Peter says I think in terms of that or but it, it that, it's, yeah. it's very cool I, even, no matter how, how how much the sun blasts it's, it's very they're very cool rooms actually they are so the design definitely works one of the, just to follow up on your point about the kind of how we managed it one of the uh, um, bit of kind of lessons learned that from the practice was that actually it was only really two of us, or there was a third individual who helped as well for a little bit, but it was a very small group. It's a very, as I was saying, quite a simple building, and you could do quite a lot in a short space of time. If you had an afternoon or an evening or you know day on the weekend, you could cover quite a lot of ground. Um, but one of the feedback was actually, wouldn't it be better to kind of get more people in the practice involved? Uh, and we, I think we have, so we've done a number of projects since of this. And one project we tried to do with quite um, a number of different, uh, you know, I think over 10, 20 people involved in the process. And that's quite difficult to manage in itself. Um, so we have tried lots of different ways of doing it. Because obviously, you know, for us, it was great to be involved in it some, some time ago now, but great to be involved with it. And um, it's, you know, the more people we can get in. But it's difficult to manage that because the projects mm -hmm. are often so small and quite intimate. That, you're um, on top of each other. Yeah, you're on top of each <laughs> other, yeah. And, and luckily, we were complementary. Um, just, you know, it didn't didn't ever really uh, become a problem. But I can imagine if there was, you know, five of us working on a project like that, it would have been quite difficult to work out who does exactly what, because it would have been all over, you know, on top of one another, as you say. 
Okay, more ideas? Yes, there's someone in the back. If you could do the project again, is there anything you'd do differently with the design? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything different, differently with the design. I would have, coming back to the gentleman's question earlier, I don't know, I, I think we, it would have maybe been quite nice to identify a, a young architect from Malawi, if, mm -hmm. you know, and, and somehow and get them to come and do a placement here or something like that and then and then and then help and then then maybe get a bit involved with the project and then help deliver on site you know something like that but that would have taken a you know a lot of planning and i don't know how one would have identified someone uh, and who would have been willing to then go back out and be involved to help build capacity really i think from a design perspective the only thing was that we you know we we perhaps design, we went a little bit far before we on the first visit um, uh, and but then after the first visit, we were able to you know rationalise it completely and make it appropriate. So I don't think so. I think maybe the quarry tiles were, a, you know, they were a, perhaps we could. Yeah. I don't know. They're very nice. They're very nice. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of breakage when they uh, during the delivery, which uh, I think caused some friction. Uh, um, uh, yeah. So that was you know perhaps could have considered it. But yeah, generally I think we were comfortable with most of the design and specification aspects. Yeah, and I think, I think getting Peter's feedback has been really great, knowing that the materials have been durable and things like that. So I yeah. think it's much the lesson learned that you've got that confidence if you do it again, I think, as much as anything. So. And that is really important. It, it, uh, it's no good if it lasts for five years, but you've got 12 on it? No, well, not quite. Eight. Yeah. Eight years since it was finished. So you've seen it go through the seasons and... Um, yeah. Not rust and not fall apart, so that's good. No, it's, yeah. it's a sturdy little building. Now, I, I was just going to say, if you just imagine a different project, um, I know you're sort of working on a, on a school, but I think one of, one of the issues about the developing countries is, is actually to have something which you can replicate in many other places. So whatever building one's doing, if it's, if it's like for a school or something of like that nature, if it's done highly cost effectively and it's easy to build, then it's all, and if maybe you've got a design which is suitable for X number of people, Y number of people, with all the ancillary things, then you've almost got a, a pre planned format, a blueprint, which can just be rolled out by people who want, want to build schools. Because simplicity, like, like microfinance works because we work in groups, we have a very, very tight model. Everybody knows what they, what they have to do. And there's very clear um, objectives against which everyone's measured. So applying those principles to, to architecture for education, it's a fantastic opportunity, I'm sure, or for, or for, or for, other, or for other things. Because it's not just a building, it's actually, what, it's actually what the future that building can hold in other places. Because it's a gift, isn't it? You're giving a gift of your time. Yeah. And you're giving that gift to the country. But it's more than that. It's where it can go to in the longer term. It enables so, other things. Yeah, so, so think... I must, my, my concept would always be think big. Think beyond the building. Think, we want to build 500 of these things, whatever it is. Or, you know, or 1,000. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about the macro business. Um, it was obviously really good for that one particular lady that she scaled up. But I just wanted to know, what was the impact on other local businesses? Was it a positive? Was it a negative? You know, it's, I mean, it's very positive. Yeah, of course, there are people that, when they start to run a business, they find they're not really business people. Um, but the majority of businesses are very, very successful. And where you find that businesses aren't successful, normally it's because they've had issues. And the biggest issue that they have is not because they have, they're not working hard. It's because someone in their family has fallen ill. And therefore, some of the money they've got for their business development, they've been compromised. Do I let my son die? Or do I take some of that money to help him? And that's the main reason why businesses might sometimes run into trouble. And that's one of the reasons why we have a whole issue around training other members of the group to help other ladies who run into trouble. In fact, if you go to a group and you say, you know, who's helping another member in the group, say a group of 15, you'll find three or four hands will go up. 
And in each case, you'll ask, well, what's the story? And you'll find quite an emotional, compelling story of that difficulty that woman's had. But because she's been helped by other members, she can get through it. And that's the way we try and deal with it. Now, how, yeah, it's been how do you hit on the kind of idea of the kind of group, uh, doing it in groups and, and, and women only? I mean, and was that something well, that... Well, women, kind of I, well, first of all, I go here, rural. I went, I was, it was rural women because I didn't have any money. I only had £10,000 when I started. And uh, I knew if I went into a town, there was no way it would last more than a week. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and it was women, because when you talk to the local community, they always say, you know, the women... Well, it's true in the UK too, actually. <laughs> you know, they look after their, they look after the money because they want to look after their families. They don't waste it. Whereas the men would tend to divert lots of the money for drink. Um, I'm afraid that's a truism, but it's, it's, it's certainly true in, in a place like Malawi. Um, and they're very reliable. They work, women work well together, much better than men do. So they do help one another. So the group works? The group works, works well. You wouldn't, do the, you yeah, wouldn't have an effective group with men in the same way. It wouldn't work the same way. But the men, we always get the men involved. When they have their loans, the husbands come along and they say, I approve of my wife or partner having this loan because we want to make sure that the husband or partner is supportive of the loan, because otherwise he might go and take the money mm -hmm. and use it for something else. So it's an important part of our process. Yeah. OK, well, maybe we've gone through all the most burning questions. And I was wondering, um, yeah? what were the key benefits to Adam being involved in a project like this? Good question. Um, I think when the, when the project came along, we were just really interested in doing it. So it was as simple as that. It was the opportunity to uh, work with communities who wouldn't normally be able to commission an architect to do a project. Um, so that, that was just a really interesting opportunity to be able to see how can architecture help in a very different setting to one that you normally find yourself operating in. Um, I don't know if you... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was, you know, personally, we benefited from it, and I think others in the practice. There were other people, other people involved. The model shop were involved. I think everyone who kind of did contribute, in, you know, relished being involved, and um, and obviously it was kind of, uh, you know, the personal relationship with Peter and one of the par uh, partners, uh, um, and the, uh, you know, the sense of kind of giving back, which I think was, you know, and it, yeah, it, was, it all happened in quite an informal kind of informal way. Uh, but it, you know, it was ultimately a success. I think it was partly a testament to kind of your kind of drive. And um, but yeah, I'd, I mean, well, I'd, I can't speak for the for the kind of for the white for the wider practice. But I do think it did kind of it, it made us. You know, we there've been in quite a few pra pro pra uh, projects since that we've that we've worked on uh, in the UK and abroad. Um, and we've tried to do things slightly differently, but it ha you know it has worked, and we've had kind of mixed mixed success. And there are. Uh, other projects that, that we're doing at the moment so uh, being completed so I think there is yeah it's, it's a lot of it's about kind of staff re re reward more than anything else and in, you know it's immensely in rewarding yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah. because you you have a lot of impact by doing what you love doing anyway yeah. and it makes a big difference um, both aesthetically and practically and economically and Very we work empowering. Yeah, yeah absolutely and we work with some terrible clients so you know having, <laughs> having, a, having a wonderful client who uh, really you can't understand so yeah, yeah it's uh, it's certainly a change from the day job yeah well we should probably start to wrap up a little bit um, we have these talks uh, every month Thank you very much for giving a great presentation today. Um, our next talk is in the Building Center in February, in, on the 21st, I think it is. And this will be an Article 25 presentation. We'll present a school uh, that was built in Burkina Faso. And we hope you all come and tell your friends. This will be a bigger space so we can accommodate more people. And I hope you enjoyed the evening and get a lot of interest in humanitarian development. Thank you. Thank you.